process and maintain information sources. The nice thing about this unit is that compared to some of the other units we've done recently, this one is pretty straightforward and the questions that are asked on the skills assessment are pretty clear. They're like, well, what do you, you know, when you get documents, what order do you process them in? Or what are the main steps for processing and taking care of documents? And so it's a really nice skills assessment because of the fact that most of the answers are pretty clear and you don't really have to make any, not, not any there's no creative side in this one. This one is pretty much pretty straightforward. So as we've talked about, BSBINS 304 Process and Maintain Information Sources is one of the 12 units that you're studying for BSB 30420, the Certificate 3 in Library and Information Studies. When we start each new unit, we do an acknowledgement of country. TAFE New South Wales would like to pay our respect and acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the traditional custodians of the land, rivers, and sea. We acknowledge and pay our respect to the elders, past, present, and emerging of all nations. So what are we going to learn about in this unit? In the workbook, we're going to talk about how to undertake information process tasks, how to arrange resources to facilitate access, and how to monitor resources. And in this workbook, they talk about, they put it into three different topics. The first is undertake information process tasks. The second is arrange resources to facilitate access. And the third is monitor resources, which is exactly the same as what's above. So the first part, which is undertake information processing tasks, we're going to learn about labeling and protecting information resources, the need to check resources and make sure that they're shelf, that, that do you outsource shelf ready or do you prepare it to be shelf ready yourself? making sure that all of your resources align with your organizational procedures. The key details of information resources, how to keep them and prepare them, and even how to um, remove them from your collection um, according to organizational policies and procedures. Um, the procedures that are relevant to handling resources regarding health and safety, and since all of you are so you had the wonderful opportunity of working on workplace health and safety, and it's such a high priority for you right now. We will link it to this unit by talking about um, safety and security procedures, as well as types of issues that come up with processing systems and procedures. So when we label and protect information, we want to do these things to our resources. No, no matter what kind of a resource it is, whether it's a CD, a DVD, um, a, any physical item, we're going to do this information for. We're going to assign call numbers. We're going to attach circulating stationery. So there might be a due date slip, barcodes. Um, it turns out that um, when we did a tour recently of the um, TAFE library at Ties Hill, and all of their um, purchasing is done through the cent is, is done through central purchasing in Sydney. So when the books come to them, they're actually shelf ready. Um, they already have their barcodes on them, which is kind of a nice thing. Everything is um, done in a central location and then it comes out to the different locations. Protective covering is applied. And there are different kinds of covering that's applied to soft cover and hard cover books or storing in protective covering. And then the, the weaker fragile materials are going to be strengthened and what we use in order to strengthen the, the materials for the to, in order to maintain them for as long as possible. So here are examples of some of the stickers that we use labels and information. So there are different kinds of labels that we place on um, items. We can have unique identifiers with barcodes or RFID, radio frequency identification. Um, call number labels will tell you where um, items are supposed to go in the library, but there are additional labels, and all of these on the right-hand side are other kinds of labels that can be used in libraries to help people find their books and also to help the people shelving find the correct location of those spots in the library. So this is an example of a spine label. And we're going to learn a little bit diff later the difference between spine labels for fiction and nonfiction books. But you, the first line of this spine label has the location symbol, 
followed by the Dewey Decimal Classification number, and then either a book number or a suffix. This one ha specifically has to do with the author's last name. So there are different kinds of security measures that libraries use. Um, this is an interesting thing I found out just this semester in our physical tour of the library. The Tafe Ties Hill Library, they just stopped using um, tattle tape, which you can see is the third bullet there. It's this magnetic piece of tape that you would put into the um, inside of a book. And then as someone would walk, would walk out without checking the book out, then it would you know, ring or if it's some if it's something that's not supposed to leave the library, then you would be um, the, the notification would go off. And they said they stopped using tattle tape altogether. They just said that they have so many, so few people checking out books that they actually turned off the electricity to the 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 um the things at the doors to check it, and they stopped buying the tattle tape and stopped using the tattle tape because they're not having an issue with items being stolen. It's just not an issue, so they stopped using it. So it's just kind of an interesting um, trend that may, and I don't know if it's everywhere or it just happens at their library, but libraries do have security measures. Some are automated, some have magnetic devices, um, some are manual or informational security systems for um, using dummy cases for CDs and DVDs and actually having the real ones behind the desk. Um, the RFID tags, um, and in addition to security measures on items, libraries also have basic information technology security procedures to ensure the library security is managed um, appropriately and that the building resources and facilities are held in a secure way. And I think that a lot of libraries are moving forward spending more time information time and money on information technology security than necessarily with the the historically used security measures on physical items so how do we protect our books um, we protect and cover our information resources um, we cover our resources. It's critical to protecting the material from any conditions, wear and tear or other damages. So paperback books we cover in contact paper and hardcover books we cover in plastic. And there's a special plastic that we use in the library with special tape and um, a special contact paper that we use. So interestingly enough, um, covering a book is more difficult than it sounds. And I have a few short videos here. That how to protect a paperback with adhesive covering. We are using Duracell adhesive covering. Cut the film to the correct size, leaving about three centimeters surplus at each edge and allowing for the spine. Folding the Duracell inside the book will assist you to cut the right size. Use the grids on the cutting mat to cut straight lines. Remove the backing paper from one half of the cut piece and use a light crease as a guide for the center. Don't remove all the backing paper as this will make it harder to apply. Position the book spine in the center, then slowly roll the book onto the adhesive film. Rolling prevents air bubbles and creasing. Smooth down with your squeegee. Cut the corners flush with the corner of the book. Keep these excess pieces as you will need them later. Make an angle cut at the shoulder of the book, at the top and bottom, and fold the Duracell over the edge of the cover. Repeat these steps to cover the other side. Corner offcuts to each corner inside the cover. This is what prevents dog ears. Trim the tabs on the spine. You can see there is very little wastage with Duracell. Ensure you use a squeegee tool to help prevent air pockets. 
Okay, so that was your first one, and that is how to cover a soft cover paperback. Now we're going to cover a hardcover book. How to protect a hardback with non-adhesive covering. We are using Hansa non-adhesive plastic covering. Cut the covering to size, leaving a border about one third larger than the book cover on all edges. It is the correct size if it covers the book while closed. Fold excess plastic around both covers. Excess can be secured with fold back clips if necessary or magic tape as shown. Ensure it's tight, but not preventing the book from closing. Cut each corner on an angle so you're able to fold without straining the book itself. Tape down, making sure the tape is not on the surface of the book. Repeat on the other corner. Trim, fold and tape down the covering on the book's back cover. The Reiko bone fold is ideal for folding and creasing book covering. On large books, tuck ends into the spine using a bone folder. On smaller books, simply use scissors to trim the excess covering. Reinforcing the corners with magic tape is especially helpful when covering large children's books. Okay, so our next video is a different kind of a cover for paperback books. It's called the Lifeguard Cover. I knew I should have just put these on different slides. I'll do that for next time. How to apply lifeguard cover for paperbacks. Measure the spine width and height of the book and select the appropriate lifeguard size, as this product comes in various sizes. Peel back the backing paper, exposing the spine area, and place the book in the centre of the film. Be sure that the book is placed squarely on the cover by lining up the corresponding edges. Fold the lifeguard cover over the spine of the book and use a squeegee as you press down over the remaining cover. Turn over and repeat on the other side. Trim excess flush with the edge of the book using either scissors or a cutting knife. Trim the top and bottom of the spine. Reiko recommends hinge tape to be added to the hinge of books covered with lifeguards to assist with the added strain of the now rigid cover. And then there's one final video. How to protect a dust cover with single fold 2. The difference between single fold original and single fold 2 is that single fold 2 has an adhesive strip along the top of the product. It also differs in the following ways. It has white backing paper and it's typically an archival product. However, it can be supplied as a non-archival product too. Select the size of single fold best suited to the size of the dust jacket, making sure the jacket is not taller than the backing paper. Insert the dust jacket between the plastic and the backing paper. 
cut a piece approximately one centimetre longer than the dust jacket on each side. Turn face down and then fold the top of the single fold down a few centimetres to secure it in place. Make sure the jacket is firmly against the folded edge of the film. Having an adhesive strip makes it very easy to fold the top of the product down securely. Just remove the strip covering the adhesive and fold it over, sticking it onto the backing paper and sealing the film in place. Make it neat but not too tight or you will not be able to slide the book back in. Mold the jacket that's now covered in single fold around the book to make sure that it fits. This will create creases in the right places and make it easier to insert later. Replace the dust jacket on the book by inserting the cover between the dust jacket and the paper. Use a few small pieces of double-sided tape to hold it in place on both the front and back covers. So as you can see, there are some really cool tools to use to take care of your books, depending on what it comes with. Is it hardcover? Is it soft cover? Is it, um, is it a dust jacket? But you can see that there are different ways to um, cover your books. And so those are some of the techniques that you would use. Then, okay, back to the PowerPoint. Wow, they're all going at the same time. Okay, over that. Moving on, um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, you can actually outsource the process of getting books shelf ready because there are a lot of different tasks as you can see on the left hand side of this slide that are involved in doing this process and it kind of takes away from the ability to do other jobs at the library so some people actually will outsource it um, and checking for self Shelf readiness depends on the genre and the guidelines and policies in your library. So shelf readiness at each different library means something different, which which if they use barcodes, if they use RFID, if they use tattle tape, if they, you know, which type of um, cover they're using, what barcodes, all, what do they have due date slips, all those things, it'll depend. And, and as we always do, we always look at the policies and guidelines of each individual library. So once we get them ready for circulation and we put them into circulation, we actually have to shelve our books once they're returned. And this is a six part process um, of shelving items when they come into the library. So number one, the, the items are returned to the library. The next thing that they that people will do is sort the items by format on, and collections. Sometimes it's done manually and sometimes it's done by a sorting machine. If you have a particularly li large library, there might be a sorting machine. Um, this is the point at which items would be identified as damaged and placed in the repair area. Someone is going to, between the point that they're sorted and placed on the trolleys is where somebody's going to actually look at the resources and determine if they have to go into a different category of, of items needing to be repaired. Then they're going to be placed on the trolleys based on category. Um, sometimes trolleys are at, of, re of recently returned resources are actually left in areas of the library so that customers, if they're if they have a really high circulation, instead of taking them back to the shelves, sometimes there will actually be a trolley of recently returned items. So because they get checked out so often, then the the resources get sorted into shelving order on the trolley. So you don't just put them in any or you can put them on any order in the trolley, but you do actually sort it on the trolley before you go out to the stacks. So you're not going from this area to that area and this area to that area, but actually you're going to continue going along the shelves in alphabetical and numerical order. 
and library staff works directly from the trolleys to shelf the items. Again, the damaged items to repair may be identified at that point as well. So when we look at each of these different items, we're going to determine what might need to be fixed. So on a dust jacket, which is just the paper on the outside of a hard cover, it's a detachable outer cover, usually made out of paper and printed text and illustrations. The outer cover has folded flaps that holds it to the front. A soft cover book is a paperback, also known as soft cover. It has a thick paper or a cardboard cover, and it's often held together with glue, and they're usually very inexpensive. Hardcover books are bound with rigid protective coverings. They may have more flexible sewn spine, which allows the book to lie flat on a surface, but they're more durable and are frequently protected by the artistic dust jackets. So here is a slide on the anatomy of a book, a video. Oh, let me make sure, hold on a second. Okay. A dust jacket is the paper cover that wraps around the outside of a book and folds inside the boards. It is usually printed and may have illustrations. It protects the book's cover and spine from wear and light. The cover board of a book is the simple cover, not yet covered with cloth or leather. The spine is the surface of a book that usually faces outward when a book sits on a shelf. The header cap is the topmost part of the book spine. The bottom cap is the base of the book spine. The crease is the groove in a book's outside case that runs head to tail, front and back. There are two of them. The tube is the open space between a book spine and the backs of the signatures. A signature is made of four or multiples of four pages folded from a single sheet of paper and stitched together. The contents of a book are all the signatures found inside. The end paper is a folded sheet of paper, one half of which is glued to the inside front or back cover of the book. The other leaf extends freely and serves as the first or last page of the book and is called a fly leaf. The fly leaf meets the end paper at the inside of the creases. The hinges of a book are the joints between a book's cover and contents. The spine inlay is a strip of paper glued to the inside of a book's spine to provide extra strength. It is found underneath the spine. The super paste cloth is a piece of meshed material that gives extra support by attaching to the signatures and the cover board. Paper lining is the paper used for lining the backs of the signature on books. A super is the thin, loosely woven, open mesh cotton fabric that forms the hinge between the cover and the pages of a book. It is found on top of the super paste cloth. The casing is the entire cover or case of a book that protects the contents. Stitching is the thread holding a signature together. This style is typical of older books in circulation and is commonly called a library binding. However, newer books are perfect bound and held together with glued bindings. And there you have it. So now you have the anatomy of a book. So there are some issues that come up with processing systems um, when you're processing items in a library. Sometimes the incorrect barcode is provided. Sometimes it's been located to the wrong collection. Maybe in the sorting department, it went to the wrong trolley, or maybe it got moved from one trolley to another. Maybe a, tro a couple trolleys fell over and then things got put back on. Um, sometimes they have an incorrect kind of covering, and sometimes there's incorrect labeling. So we need to be aware of the fact that those issues do exist in processing books. So I talk about random announcements in um, 
these workbooks. And this seems to be one of those random announcements. These are the important soft skills combined with technical skills that are important for your role in working in libraries. And they are reading, you've probably heard these before when you start education, you always look at these different things, but reading, writing, oral communication and numeracy. And then we in this program have a unit on teamwork, self-management, problem solving and technology. And I added here technology, technology dexterity, okay, which um, I, I, it isn't that you need to know every single computer software program out there. It's that you need to understand software and how it works and how a library management system works so that if you, you know how to use one library management system, when you go to a new library, you understand what the cataloging module module does and you understand what the circulation module does. And so um, you need to have that dexterity so that you can learn new systems in a new location. So the next topic is about arranging resources to facilitate access. So in this topic, we're going to talk about the types of common classification systems and formats, methods of organizing and arranging materials, equipment and information, and then procedures relevant to handling resources, including safety procedures. So each item uh, for storage and care of different formats, each item has its own processing maintenance, storage, um, and storage issues, depending on what it is. And I didn't um, put the entire table into the um, PowerPoint here. This is just the beginning of the table. But you can see how there's a difference between how we're going to treat print material to how we're going to treat film material and how we have examples of what they are, what the equipment that's required is, what the problems are with care, with the correct handling procedures, and then what we do in terms of proper storage and preservation. And so in your book on pages 32 to 35, you'll find details about each of the different kinds of materials we would have in a library and what the proper um, um, processing, maintenance, and storage is of each of them. So where do we purchase our all these special storage products? And there were five different um, um, companies that were listed in the workbook, and I decided to share some their web pages with you and what they do. So RACO um, meets the diverse needs of libraries and learning spaces. Um, in particular, they have um, products and customer service. They renewed their focus on quality, sustainability, and Australian made products. And these are just some of the products that they have. So when we think about, you know, where does that shelving come from? Where does the furniture come from? All these things we just looked at from about book covering and book repair, where does that come from in special promotions? So this is one of the companies. Here's QLS, which specifically has to do with um, high, put adding function to spaces. So they're primarily furniture and shelving with different ideas for different types of needs. There's something in the chat box. Let me see what's there. Oh, okay. Um, then we have, I don't know if it's Siba or Saiba. Um, signs, it's a sign company, and but not just big signs, they have shelf signage. They have wall, floor, and window signage. They, this is one of the companies who sells the spine labels and posters and book displays. Um, so for them, they say that they have enhanced school learning environments with signage that is both, ed both educationally sound and attractive. Okay, so that's their um, about story. And then we have Fry Library and School Supplies, another one who has um, signage, furniture. They happen to have phone lockers, which is a different, um, a, a, a fairly modern, um, something that it's a fairly modern need in libraries. And here's less badic book binders. Um, they, they have high standards for quality product that we kept to this day. We continue. to be pioneers primarily in the book binding industry. So they, they focus on book binding. So those are five of the companies that provide services to libraries. 
So there are different kinds of shelv arra shelving arrangements, and I put these all on one slide here. But the first one is open access compar compared to closed access. I don't know if any of you have heard of the stacks in libraries. And what stacks are is there's there resources that are put behind closed doors and somebody needs to actually go get them for you. They're closed access. Um, there's open access is when you can just walk into the library and access it. And of course, open access and closed access also relates to our digital resources, specifically databases. Um, open access means anybody, it's free and anybody can use it, but closed access, meaning that you need a subscription. We have integration of resources versus segregation of resources. And an example might be if you had a romance section, but then you also have, or you have a romance section separate from a travel section. Or if you have everything that's, and it relates to the next one, do you arrange it based on classification or sequential? So we're going to look at the Dewey Decimal System. It's coming up, classification system. It's coming up in one of the future slides. But sequential system is where you actually label books and put them into your catalog based on when they were received by the library. So their tag on the book is going to be 20, you know, March of 2023, book one, March of 2023, book two. OK, it's all going to be sequential. So instead of separating things by fiction or nonfiction, you would simply do it sequentially. And the reason that people would do it sequentially is one of the issue that comes up with um, organizing books by classification is you end up having to move sections of books, large sections of books to make more space. So if you have a shelf right here for the A's and then the B's and then the C's, what happens when you have more A's than go on the shelf? Well, then you have to move the B's down and then you have to move the C's down and you have to do that. So in order to not have to deal with that, what some libraries are doing is they do them purely sequential. And then when you go look for it, it you just go to the number in order of where it's located, okay? Um, and here are some examples of how these, um, just how each of these different um, items are organized in these two different libraries. So the picture books for five for small children have no formal arrangement. Library B is organized by color coded stickers. So some people just take all their picture books and they put them into one section and it doesn't matter what order they're in or author or anything. They just put them all into one section. Magazines can be order, um, organized by topic or they can be organized alphabetically. DVDs can be by genre um, or organized by first letter, letter of the title. Junior fiction could be shelved by first letter of the author's surname or organized on paperback stands by genre. So you can see how there are different choices to be made in shelving arrangements. So here's more about shelving arrangements. Um, you can do it by format in alphabetical order, by numerical order, classification number, by audience, lending conditions, or size of print. So those are just more options for how you could arrange books in a library. And it's a decision that's made by the library staff um, who works in the library. And it also, what probably influences it is what the needs of your community are. OK. So there is a difference in libraries about how fiction items are shelved compared to nonfiction. So all fiction items typically, such as books, audiobooks, music, CDs, and movies, are shelved alphabetically. They're shelved by the name of the author or artist, um, but they may be arranged by genres. Um, and then fiction, like Hollywood movies, are shelved by title. OK, so basically all of the ones in the first one are done by author, whereas the movies are done by title, OK, is a typical way of arranging um, fiction items in a library. And now we move on to Dewey Decimal Classification and nonfiction. So Dewey Decimal Classification is a classification system which divides all knowledge 
into a number of disciplines and arranges the topics within each discipline hierarchically. The system assigns a three digit number to each area of knowledge so that materials can be shelved in numerical order with materials on the same subject together. Within each area, subjects can be further defined by adding additional numbers after the decimal point. So as you can see, there are 10 main categories. These 10 colors are the zeros, the 100s, the 200s, the 300s. Within each of those, they're broken up into 100, 101, 102, 103, all the way up to 199. And you can see the topics that are in them and you can actually um, find, you can, you'll, if you Google it, you can Google the level two and the level three of Dewey Decimal. But the, the most important part for you to understand about this is that each book is going to get a Dewey Decimal classification that's already been assigned. You just have to put it into the correct category and then it'll be defined. Now, the nice thing is there was a time when you would have to actually figure it out yourself and there were these big books and you'd have to look through. Now, almost I think every book, when you buy them from the um, vendors, they come with the full mark record, the full digital record, and the Dewey Decimal is already assigned to it. So you don't have to actually look it up and, and figure out what it is. But there is a whole class on classifying, which um, a whole unit on this, which talks about how to assign it. There is another system, a, a Library of Congress system. Dewey Decimal is um, separated into 10 categories, and I think that Library of Congress is 21 or 22. So the Dewey Decimal number is different from a call number. And I wanna make sure you understand that. The Dewey Decimal number may be a part of the call number, but it's not the entire call number. The call number is used to determine the location of an item in the library, okay? Um, it tells you where it's located on the shelves or other storage areas. So there are two main functions of a call number. One is to provide a unique identity number for each item in the collection. And the second is to arrange the items in a logical order on the shelves. So it, it, um, a call number typically has three different parts, a location symbol, which shows which collection it's in or the sequence the item belongs to, a Dewey classification number that shows what topic and discipline is covered. But remember, Dewey is only for nonfiction, okay? Then it has a book number, and that's a number, a letter, or a symbol used to distinguish one item from all the other ones in the same area. So here are some examples of call numbers. Here are some examples on the left-hand side of different areas where it could be. The reference books are all going to have REF at the top, or P is periodicals are going to have a P. In the lending collection, you'll have a general collection, liter literacy collection, large print, audiovisual, or quarto. Um, and then you'll see on the right hand side here that the number beginning with single or double digits, with a single or double digit, you'll see that the number, um, the number, the the Dewey Decimal number is the top number and the number of the book with that same number is the second line, okay? Sometimes libraries won't have um, book numbers in the low numbers, they'll start with a thousand just so that they, they just, it's like when, when you used to order checks and you would start your check starting at a thousand instead of a lower number, it's the same kind of thing. Um, that you just know from a thousand, your first book, book number a thousand is your first book, and then one and two. You'll see these all have the same Dewey Decimal number on them. And then when you have fiction, you're going to have the author's surname, um, or you could use the author's sur surname even in nonfiction instead of having a number sequence. Okay. And then just so you know, the number sequence is filed before the letters. So if you were filing all of these together, they would be in the order listed here because the ones come before the thousands and the numbers come before the letters. Okay. 
so basically there are a number of steps on the next two slides. You'll see that there are five steps to shelving procedures. OK, and the first one that we and we kind of already talked about this, but we talked about sorting the material by format and making sure that um, these are some of the different categories and how you might sort them when you're sorting physical items in the library. Then you're going to place them on the top trolleys, arrange the items fully by call number. You don't want to you want to avoid backtracking along the shelves. Once you have them on the trolley, the next step is to push the trolley to the appropriate area and you'll need to shelve each item in the order in the correct place on the shelves. Um, and if the shelves are not already in a good order, then you may need to reposition a couple of items. Um, you want to cre avoid creating double runs. This can happen if the shelver does not check the item at the end of one shelf before moving to the next shelf, including around corners. You have to make sure that you, that you don't just put it at the end because that's where it goes. You have to look at the next shelf, look at the next shelf down, look around the corner to make sure that your book is placed in the right place. By the way, when I was shelving at the Yosemite Research Library, it seems like the simplest thing ever, and it just gets confusing. Like, I don't know why. It's just numerical and alphabetical order, <laughs> but it's a lot of numbers and a lot, and you like one and then one zero and then one zero five. Like, they're all on the one section, but you have to go all the way past the ones before you get to one zero, one ones. And then it's just anyway, it gets confusing. I'm just saying. I'm sure people who are really good at it are really, really good at it. I wasn't very good at it. Um, once you have the item in its correct place, you need to quickly and efficiently straighten the row. Moving items level with the front of the shelf and care should be taken that the items are not packed too closely. Um, and that bookends are supporting the row. So you want to take care of your um, resources. So. And welcome to Southeast Regional Library's instructional video on how to shelve library materials. I'm James Richards, Regional Branch Manager for Southeast Re oh. Regional Library. Sorry. This video is designed to show library staff how to shelve library materials at a Southeast Regional Library branch. We will begin with shelving fiction items. Fiction items are shelved alphabetically by the first three letters of the author's last name. This holds true for both adult and children's fiction materials. This also holds true for all formats of fiction such as books, audiobooks on CD, large print, etc. In the event that authors have the same first three letters of their last name, shelve the items alphabetically by the next letters of the last name until you reach a tiebreaker, so to speak. For example, the author McNabb would be shelved ahead of the author McNaught. In the event of authors with the same last name, shelve the items alphabetically according to the author's first name. For example, Robert Parker would be shelved ahead of T. Jefferson Parker. In the event of the same author with multiple titles, shelve the items alphabetically according to the title. For example, Fern Michaels' book, Celebration, would be shelved ahead of her book, Finders Keepers. Nonfiction items are shelved using the Dewey Decimal Classification System, or DDDC for short. The DDC is used to shelve nonfiction items for adult and children's items, as well as for all formats such as books, audiobooks on CD, DVDs, etc. 
the ddc is a numbering system that assigns a number to each item in the library based on the content of the item for example if a book is about dogs it will be assigned the number 636 all books about dogs will have 636 as their main number a decimal point is then inserted to further specify what the book is about the numbers after the decimal can get quite long, but typically only go another two or three spaces. For example, if a book is about spaniels, it'll be given the number 636.75. The 636 is there because the book is about dogs, with the .75 there to indicate it is a book specifically about spaniels. A book about Samoids will be given the number 636.73. The 636 indicates it's about dogs, and the .73 specifies that it is about a different breed, such as Samoids. As a shelver, you don't need to worry too much about how the numbers are assigned, but it is helpful to know how the DDC system works. Some fiction books are arranged numerically based on their DDC number. Remember that the items are arranged in the order in which the numbers would normally appear. An item with a DDC number of 635.03 would be shelved ahead of an item with the number 635.044. Even though the number 635.044 looks bigger, the 635.03 comes first as the 0 .03 is actually representing the number 0 .030 and the 30 comes before the 44 numerically. Does everyone understand that? That was the part I got really confused about. A three looks like it's, 44 looks like it's bigger, but what you have to do is you have to add another character here. So it'd be 030 and compare 30 to 40 to 97. Of course these, um, so they're all six three fives, but because this number looks shorter, you might think, oh, well, that one, it, it just, I don't know why it's confusing because right this minute I'm looking at it. I'm like, of course, it's very logical, but I've lost books that way, like trying to find, like trying to figure out where things go or trying to find books that I was looking for. Double check the shelves at your branch often for correct shelving. It will greatly assist you and patrons in fighting items at the library. If you have any questions about shelving, please contact Southeast Regional Library Headquarters. I'm James Richards, and you've been watching Southeast Regional Library's instructional video on how to shelve library materials. Okay, so once we learn how to shelve books, we then talk about safety procedures, and there are um, whole pages on the self on the safety procedures, but basically we talk about trolleys, handling books, stretching to shelf books, and using kick stools. And just so that everybody knows what we're talking about when we talk about trolleys and kick stools, this is what they look like on the right hand side. You want to make sure that you are pushing trolleys, not pulling trolleys. If it's too heavy for you, take some books off and come back and get it later. Okay. Um, with handling books, only carry the amount that is easy to handle. Um, so don't walk with like a stack this high and like going like this, and then you're going to bump into something and drop all the books and you could get hurt and that's no fun. Stretching to shelf books, don't overload or stretch, do something else. So use one of these kick stools to get to the top shelf, sit on the kick stool to do them on the bottom shelf. Um, use them to stand or sit, but do not step on them as a stair to something else. Make sure with the kick stools that when you stand up on them, you stand right in the middle. They have wheels on the bottom. That's why they're called kick stools. You can just kick them with your foot and it'll go where you want it to go. But when you sit on it, it um, 
it 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 stops in its location, and so that's why you want to make sure not to use it as um, a step to something else. But you can stand on them to shelve books on a top shelf. So always use health and safety and think about it when you are um, shelving books. And then we move on to our last topic of this unit, which is monitoring resources. So we want to check resources for the correct arrangement. What do we do about missing or damaged resources? What basic maintenance and minor repairs of damaged resources do we do? And when, do, when to refer unresolved repairs to your supervisor? So we need to check the arrangement and report missing or damaged resources. OK, so as a library technician, you'll be required to check resources that they're correctly arranged. Um, and it's really, really important to shelf accurately. So anytime you see anything that's out of order, you should correct it and potentially even let a supervisor know because maybe the person who's doing the shelving doesn't quite know how to do it. Um, you also need to report missing or damaged resources. And as always, we need to make sure to look at organizational policies and procedures. Just so you know, when people borrow from the library, they actually take responsibility for library materials that they lose or damage. And they will be subject to fines that accrue until the item is reported lost, a replacement fee and processing fee is charged. Um, that, that while libraries are starting to decrease the number of late fees that people have, I think that they're still um, making people pay fines, paying for lost items and damaged items. So we have when we have missing or damaged items, um, we need to report it as lost and the borrower will need to pay a replacement cost. If it's re if it's returned in an irreparable damaged condition, they will also need to pay a replacement cost. If they if they fail to return it to the library by the expiration date, then depending whether your library has um, overdue fees or not, they would need those would be assessed. And then for missing or damaged resources, you need to record it in the LMS the library management system. And you're gonna hear the term LMS a lot or ILMS, they're the same thing. I stands for integrated. So it's either integrated library manage system, management system or library management system. Um, you would want to describe the situation as any of these follows, missing item being repaired, um, how much it has to be paid for, or store it safely so the missing, when it is damaged, you want to store it safely so the missing piece can be matched to the existing resource. So we want to make sure in collection maintenance, all of these parts are part of the process. We have end processing, which is the physical preparation of the library materials for inclusion in the collection. OK, we talked about that earlier, which is making the books ready to go into circulation, making them shelf ready. Um, there are a lot of different ways that we store our um, items. We shelve them in different locations based on either collection or numerically and knowing what the shelving is. In terms of the care of the collection, we provide the correct environment for the materials, checking their physical condition and repairing damaged materials. And then we also do a stock take, which often not only checks what is missing or lost, but also you, during a stock take where you figure out what, what you have in your collection, you might also do what's called weeding, which is taking items out of your collection if they're not being used. So in terms of handling different formats, as a general rule, items should be moved carefully to avoid dropping them. Items with sensitive services should not be touched. Materials should be kept clean and dust free and any equipment required to use an item should be regularly cleaned. So I think they're more talking about things like DVDs, CDs, microfiche, microfilm. Um, even old papers should be stored in appropriate um, sleeves or boxes. Um, whatever's in the best interest and also possibly wear gloves depending on how old it is or what the item is. 
So, uh, you know, like it says, keep your hands clean. Don't eat or drink in proximity to library books. This is something that's changed a lot over the last 20 years. It used to be no food, no drinks, end of story. Now there's kind of this, well, you can bring a water bottle as long as your water bottle closes. A lot of, a lot of libraries have, um, they have cafes in the library. So maybe you can have a coffee cup as long as it has a lid. Um, the other thing that some libraries are doing, especially with meeting rooms, because they're trying to encourage people to use the meeting rooms, is say that, for instance, you can have food, but no hot food. So like you can bring a sandwich, but you can't bring a pasta. You know, you, you can't bring things that are greasy, no pizza. Um, but if you bring something that's like a simple snack or something that's not really going to hurt any of the resources, that's kind of one of the shifts in um, which also, by the way, another shift in general in libraries kind of relating to that has to do with shushing people and like the reputation of libraries shush, shush, shushing people um, nowadays people are encouraging people to talk the librarians are encouraging communication and talking and community so avoid forcing the books to lie open further than they easily do and support the cover when the volume is open and in terms of the storage environment if especially for special collections or rare items, the blinds should be closed in storage area areas or you should have no windows in your storage areas. Those are great places. Um, basements are, are like underground um, um, levels are perfect places to store stacks and um, rare items. Don't put the items where the sun can shine on them and turn the lights off. And that's, you know, for special collections or rare items that you want to really take care of them. Handling and using, you don't want to use wet fingers. So no licking your finger and turning the page. That is not as much as, as easy as it makes it. You don't want to do that. When working with them, make sure you have a clean workspace. Keep the items flat if possible. But rare or tightly bound books should, should be laid open on a book support. Never lean on books. Use a pencil if you have to write in a book. If there are essential notes, such as call numbers made on them, make sure to use a soft lead pencil. And if pages of the books and other items have to be marked, use acid-free paper strips. Do not fold the corners of books or use printed, colored, or adhesive paper, such as Post-it self-adhesive notes, okay? There are more handling topics and details in the book related to photocopying, transport, storage. Books should generally be stored upright. Pamphlets should be stored in pockets or boxes, boxes the polypropylene pockets. Single sheet documents, um, flat is best for them, but they can be upright in a folder. Specifically with pamphlets and single sheets, you, don't, you want to avoid the slumping. So you want to do everything you can to keep them as flat as possible. And for large sheet material like maps, you want to keep them flat in drawers. If they are rolled up, you want to be careful when you're handling them. And the, the, the rule of thumb is to keep hold them from opposite corners is the best way to hold a rolled material. There's more on this in the book and you can read more about it. So what do we do when there's damage and repair of library materials? Um, there are, and these are some of the ways items can get damaged, and some of them we don't really think about, okay? Chewing. Children or animals could be chewing them. People could write on them. There are folded pages, yellowing, broken spines, wear and, wear and tear, smoke, vandalism, water, pest infestation, scratched discs, parts of the kits are missing, missing or torn pages, fading due to light exposure, or desensitization, desensitization of security devices. So there are a lot of different things that can happen to our resources that we need to pay attention to. So we have different kinds of repairing materials. So we have things to avoid damage, and then we have items to mend and repair things. So we, like we looked at earlier, you want to apply protective coverings ahead of time. We have mending and replacing packaging of kits, repairing or replacing pages, replacing broken CDs or DVDs, replacing security tags, and strengthening the spine. So we want to use high-quality repair materials. 
Um, you can use um, good quality, easy to use contact paper, strong plastic covering or jackets, professional disc cleaning devices, cloths, cleaning fluid, acid-free, non-yellowing adhesive tape. So when it was talking about sticky tape earlier, you wanna make sure that it's acid-free, non-yellowing adhesive tape. And then there's fabric woven adhesive tape, and then there's strong and wide staplers. Okay, they can all be used for different um, repairs on different items. And then finally, um, sometimes our materials do need to be disposed of. Sometimes they do go in the trash. Sometimes they do go in recycling. Sometimes they get sent to other locations. But you have to remember that whatever you do, you have to do it in, accord, in accordance with the retention and disposal policies and procedures of your organization. So keep that in mind. And there you have it. This unit is much simpler and much more straightforward than what we studied last. So does anyone have any questions about the unit?